Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Gospel Hour with David. Glory be to God, Jesus Christ is alive. Today, I have a good subject, good topic to talk about. Uh, I had a couple questions come in from a couple different people, and I really think that when you have two or more witnesses, it must be God, right? And so I believe God wants to speak to us today. And so the first question that came in was, uh, I want to know more about the transfiguration of Jesus there. And he's got his disciples. And I want to know what that was about and what is the meaning of that. And another question came in from another person. And they said, you know, the Bible, isn't it really teaching us readiness or preparedness? how to be ready and, and to be prepared, right? And, and yes, I believe both questions are intertwined to one question. So what are we wanting to be prepared for? Well, the transfiguration. That's what we're preparing for. And, and in it, we're preparing for what? The coming of our Lord. So I wanna explain all that today. First of all, in that being preparedness, where do we got to go? We need to go all the way back to the beginning. We need to go to Deuteronomy chapters 5. That's when Moses saw God face to face. And who did Moses see? We see that Moses saw Jesus, right? Elijah was there on a mountain, and it goes, and he's in the cave. And, and who came and whispered? into the ear of Elijah, right? Jesus. And so Jesus brings everything together into one place, into one spot, in one moment in time. Now, Moses represents like the past, right? Elijah represents the things that are to come, right? And Jesus represents the present. See, God is in the past, future, and present, all happening at one time, in the same time, in the same moment, in the same place. We gotta recognize, what is God trying to say to us today? <clears throat> well, first thing God wants us to know, He is our God. Our God is not wicked, evil, despiteful, or spiteful, He, he, he does not despise his creation, or his word, or his promises. God is good. And this is what God wants us to know. He is our Lord. He is our all. So, chapter 5 of the book Deuteronomy, Moses is given commandments. <clears throat> and the commandments from God. And at verse 22, it says this, and you know the commandments, thou shalt not steal, murder, commit, right? Law number one, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And do not create images of God or out of love for God. Any images of God of heaven or, or heavenly things, whether angels or God himself. Only God, right? God is one. So verse 22, let me read these. This is all going to set up for later. What are we preparing ourselves for? What is God trying to prepare us for? All right. It says, These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain out of the top, out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness with a loud voice. And he added no more. So, so the law of God is the Ten Commandments. Everything that proceeded after the Ten Commandments was, was just, you know, that, that defining what is love thy neighbor as you wish to be loved. That, that's what all the Ten Commandments are about. That's what Moses was all about. Love your neighbors, in the same way you wish to be loved. Now, 
He says, He wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. And as soon as you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me. All the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. Out of the fire. Right? So, whose voice, is, who's are, who are those in the fire? Right? And they hear the voice of God. Remember that there was the rich man in Lazarus, and the rich man would not give to Lazarus any compassion, food, or anything. And all Lazarus wanted was, and he would have been content only having the scraps from the man's table. Yet the man wouldn't even give him that. In fact, the dogs came and lit on his sores. Nobody showed the man compassion. Later, both men died. Right? And, and there's a man, the rich man goes to hell, and he's there in the fire. And he looks up, and, and he sees Abraham, and he has Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. And he says, Father Abraham, let Lazarus come down here and, and touch my tongue with one drip of water. Just one drip. Because I'm in agony, and I'm in pain, and I'm suffering. And Abraham says, you had Moses. should have listened to Moses. And you would not have been in that place of suffering. He says, my brothers, I have five brothers who are still alive. Could you just warn them not to come to this place? So they won't experience this agony that I am in. Perhaps if you rose a man back to life, they would believe him. And Abraham says, even if we rose someone back to life, they will not believe. They had not believed Moses. They're not going to believe a dead man rising back to life. He said, while you were on earth, you enjoyed goodness and pleasure and all the goodness of God. While this man suffered, and now this man enjoys all the goodness and the greatness of God while you are suffering. See, each one of us will be held accountable for our own deeds, for our own actions, whether good or right. God gave each one of us one choice. Love your neighbor. That's the choice. You can do it or not do it, but that's a choice. Love each other the same way you wished you were to be loved. And, and that's a choice. And God gives this choice to each one of us. Now, he goes on to say, This day we have seen God speak with man, and man still live. Now, therefore, why should we die? Right? For this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of our, the Lord our God anymore we shall die for who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speak out of the midst of the fire as we have and still live and has still lived. Go here, go near and hear all that the Lord our God will say. 
and speak to us all that the Lord our God will speak to you. And we will hear it and do it. And the Lord heard your words. And when you spoke to me and the Lord said to me, I have heard the words of this people, which they have spoken to you. They are right in all that they have spoken. On that they had a heart as this always, to fear me and to keep all my commandments. That is, that it may go well with them, with their descendants forever. Now, listen. All right, Jesus, there at the transfiguration, let, let's go see that at, at Mark, chapters 9. All right. After six days, Jesus took him, Peter, and James, and John, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. So we got... Peter, rock, right? We had the rock. The son, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which Jesus also called them the sons of thunder. So you got the sons of thunder, you got the rock, and you got the Messiah, Jesus. And they go up on a high mountain, and Jesus was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And they appeared to them Elijah and Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. Right? Peter said, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents. One for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say. They were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them. They couldn't see nothing. A voice came out of the cloud and said, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anything or anyone with them, but Jesus alone. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead, so that they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising of the dead might mean. And they asked him, Why do you... Why do the scribes say, Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. How is it written, how is it written out of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. Right? So, John the Baptist was Elijah, right? And, and that's who Jesus is speaking of. And they did everything they wanted to Elijah. Elijah came to restore all things. Why? What was it that Elijah comes to restore? Our relationship with God, Jesus is God himself, right? So God says to Moses, here I give you the stones, the tablets, two times, a second time, because Moses broke the first ones, a second time he gives them the Ten Commandments and, and comes down and says, look, here's, here are the Ten Commandments. Here it is. And he, and he hands it to Moses. And what did he give and hand to Moses? Jesus Christ. Before Moses went up to the mountain, they sacrificed animals and they take the blood. 
And the first thing he does is he throws blood right onto the altar, right? And then he throws blood, and the blood signifies, before I even go into the presence of God, the blood covers me of the sin. The blood, whatever sin. Same with Jesus. He covers us in his blood to cover us for the sin. What are we preparing for? We're preparing to meet God face to face, just as Moses. Moses, when he came down off the mountain, his face shone, his face had a, had a shine to it. He was transfigured because he was speaking face to face with God. And all the people were then all of a sudden afraid of Moses. And they stayed far off and away from Moses because all of a sudden Moses was holy. And what does it mean when God says, I call you people holy. You are my chosen holy people. Well, the word healed, healed means holy. These are my healed people. And how, how are they healed? They're healed to become holy. There's a transfiguration. We, we were once dead in sin, dead in transgression. The transfiguration is we are now alive in Christ Jesus. Alive. See, when we see our sin, we see Jesus Christ crucified. That's what sinners see because that's what we see. Our sin hanging on that cross. Is that what we come to the Lord for? Just random just forgiveness or we come to the Lord to be healed because when we look at that cross we look at Jesus and we see the suffering son of God we should see our sins hanging there and by seeing our sins what do our sins look like it should transform us it should make us turn away from our sins so that we could become more like Christ. Not a man hanging on a cross, but God who rose him up to glorify him. The glorification of God's promise, of God's word working in our lives. It's about the transformation of our lives. So what are we preparing for? We're preparing to become teachers, fathers, men of God. And what are we preparing to talk to those who are broken, lost, hurt, depressed, who are suffering? So in order to have an effective ministry, an effective, be an effective ambassador of Jesus Christ, we're preparing something. We're preparing ourselves for something. And what are we preparing for? The enemy. Because the enemy is going to come like a roaring lion. To, to devour, to destroy. And we have to be prepared for when our enemy comes. Not with guns and, and might, swords or weapons, but we're going to be prepared for when they come into our presence so that we can give them the glory and the grace of, of God. We could give them the Ten Commandments. As God said, our, and the first two or the first ten or stone tablets are written on stone. So in other words, so when we take this word of God, we got this Bible. That's the stone. That's the stone. In the beginning, God was the word and the word was God. And then that word became flesh and lived amongst us. The ten commandments. So he gives to Moses, he gives to Elijah, he gives to us the Ten Commandments. What are the Ten Commandments? Jesus Christ. He gives to Jesus Christ and puts in Jesus Christ's heart. Not written on stone and paper, but into his heart. And he goes into the world to deliver to the world the Ten Commandments. Love your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. It's all your being. And what does that look like? 
Jesus Christ comes to show you, this is how I wish to be loved. As he's beat down, broken down, hung on a cross, spat on, he has the power to control the universe. He has the power to turn stones into food. He has the power to feed himself. He has the power to heal himself. Yet he uses his power to feed others, to help others, to restore others. Jesus cares you. Jesus heals you. And that's his desire. So God says, I give to you. What are the Ten Commandments? Here, I give to you. And they say, what should we make? Three tabernacles? One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for Jesus? One for the Christians, one for the Muslims, and one for the Jews? God says, and there's a cloud, and you can't see anything. The cloud is so thick. And a great voice comes out. This is my son in whom I love. Listen to him. Listen to him. That's the commandments of God. Listen to him. And this is what Jesus comes to be in a living example of what does the Ten Commandments look like. Thou shalt not commit adultery. So Jesus says, I, I, I married to God. I'm married to the Ten Commandments. I, I, God, shall not commit adultery. I will not say to you, I will love you through sickness and health, good times and bad times, and yet not keep my promise. I shall love you every day to the end. That's God. That's, that's, I will not commit adultery. I will not hurt, murder, kill, or destroy that which I love, even if it tries to destroy me. As Moses breaks the first commandments, he broke them because he saw that all the people were worshiping gods that were not gods. They were worshiping idols things created by the works of men and not trusting in the work of God. Moses puts a, a veil over his face so nobody can see him. And it's not that nobody could see him, that nobody could see the transfiguration. The transfiguration. Now we go to the mark of the beast, right? Let's go to the book of Revelation. We have the mark of the beast. We have one beast comes out of the water. The first beast that comes out of the water, right? And then there's a second beast that comes from the water. And, and the second beast is even more powerful than the first beast. And, and that first beast, right, is going to go into the world and deceive the world and get everyone to bow down to the mark. The mark. What is the mark? Let's go back to Deuteronomy. What is the mark of the beast? Huh? It's in the Bible. God told us all these things. Uh, hold on. Got to find my Deuteronomy here, Deuteronomy. Now we see right here, the mark of the first beast. Moses is giving commands to the people. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. In the morning, we're praying. When we go to bed, we're praying. We're in the presence of the living God every day. 
And we need to believe that. You shall bind them as a sign around your hand. There's the mark. There's the mark. And everyone who receives this mark on their hand, right, they get to eat. They get relieved from suffering and pain. And they shall be as a frontlet between your eyes. You shall write them on the doors of your house post. So there we have the name written on the head. And the mark on the hand. Now Jesus goes and in his time he sees all these wicked and evil people who had crept in to the Jewish people. Crept in pretending to be Jews, yet they were not Jews. They crept in deceiving the nation of Israel. They took pieces of leather and they would wrap that leather around their right hand as though they believed. Here I have the Ten Commandments right here visibly. They had all the garments. They, they wore everything. They had the covering. They had the tassels. They were long and lengthy, their tassels. Everyone could see the wrap around their arm. And their phylacteries. A phylactery is that little square thing that they wear, the Jewish people wear right there. And they put their favorite verses or scripture right there inside. And they fold that up real tight. And then they put a little box on their head. And it's on the outside so everybody can see it. Yet inside the heart, they were wicked and evildoers. See, it's not about the clothing. It's not about what everybody can see. It's what God sees in our heart. It's not about putting it on the outside. It's not about going to church and becoming a different person in front of everybody while we're there. And then when we go home, we're yelling at our wives. We're, we're screaming at our kids in the car on our way home. Is that God? No. It's not about what people think or their opinions. We're trying always to please other people. I don't even want to please myself. I only want to please God. It's on the inside, on the inside of my mind. When the Bible is no longer a Bible, but I am the walking Bible. I am the walking Word of God. That's the transfiguration we're looking for, and that's the transfiguration that we're preparing for. The coming of our Lord. It's on the inside. Everybody's waiting to see Jesus come down with the clouds and thousands of the hosts of, ang of heaven and angels and everything. And with a mighty trump, with a mighty yell, he's going to scream out and devour his enemies. That's what people are waiting for, right? They want to see it. But blessed are those who believe and have never seen it. Here's Jesus standing in the midst of all these people who are sinners, who hated him, who were breaking him down, beating him down, criticizing him, hating him. And yet, they saw the face of God and were not destroyed. Were not destroyed. Why? Because the Ten Commandments were fully alive in Him. In Him. I do not envy what my neighbors have. I'm not jealous of, of you. My, my love and determination and my will isn't dependent upon any of your opinions or your words or your blasphemies. You can call me whatever you want. Dirty, nasty pig. You can shower me in F-bombs, yet I will not retaliate. 
I will not repay insult for insult. I will not destroy my enemy. I will not. I will bless those who seek to persecute me. I will bless those who seek to harm me. And Jesus, the good news is Jesus practices what he preaches. We, we here in this world don't even practice what we preach. You know, I saw a wonderful teaching of a man who, who's fully enlightened with the Holy Spirit. And, and he goes out and he tries to teach people love. And not just people, but he goes into the darkest places he could find. People lost in drugs, people lost in homelessness, people lost without hope. And he goes and he gets right in the midst of them. And he begins to teach them hope, love, and mercy. And, and what's so great about that guy is he's so honest. We have to be honest with ourselves. He himself even admitted it took him 70 years to be able to practice what he taught, and yet he's one of the world-renowned teachers on teaching people how to be good parents, because that's where drug addiction happens. That's where homeless ha homelessness happens. Children are raised in a home where love is not available to them. And so they go into a world, and, and how do I love when I've never seen love? When I don't know what love is, how do I love myself when the people who were put in my life to be in charge over my protection, my love, and my care did not fulfill their end of the bargain? My mom, my dad, whoever it may have been, abused me as a child. You got to understand, 99.9% .9 of all people who are drug addicts, homeless, lost, in anger, frustration, or, or, or abused as children. All the women sexually abused, and most of the boys. And if not sexually abused, they were verbally abused. They were physically abused with whippings, spankings, beatings. Let me show you how much I love you. I'm going to beat the tar out of you. That's not love. That's sin. So we're preparing ourselves. We're preparing ourselves to go into that dark world. And no matter what they say, no matter how much they reject you, you're there to deliver the Ten Commandments. I'm not going to destroy you. I'm not going to blow out your, your, your candlestick. If your light is it's just barely alive, I'm not going to blow it out by condemning you. I know you're not a drug addict. You're, you're a person who is sick. You're a person who is hurt. You're broken. And you're trying to medicate yourself. It's medication. I want to medicate myself. I want to be healed from my pains and sufferings. That's what they're doing. That's what they're seeking for. Why not give them Jesus? when he could, can, and will heal you. Now, Jesus comes off the mountain of the transfiguration. Let's go back to Mark, chapter 9. Immediately, immediately after Jesus comes down off the mountain, has this glorious experience, he's shining, he's bright. He's got Moses right there. He's got Elijah and his disciples. He's got everything going for him on top of the world. And then he comes down off that mountain. And they came down to the disciples. They saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing about? Some of the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever, he, whenever it seizes him, he throws himself down and he foams 
and he grinds his teeth, and he becomes rigid. So I ask your disciples to cast it out. Right? The man has seizures. Did you know cannabis oil will cast out seizures? Here in the United States of America and most of the world, they've been trying to make cannabis and marijuana illegal. Why? Because it will cure you. That's why. And they don't want you cured. They want you trapped under big pharma, sucking off their money. Or them sucking off your money. They want to capitalize off your pains and your weaknesses. They don't want you cured. Because if you got cured, you're no longer a customer. Now, back to our story. So I asked your disciples to cast it out. And they were not able. And he answered them, Oh, faithless, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And the spirit saw him. And immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And Jesus Oh, hold on, let me back up a little bit. And he said, foaming from childhood, and it often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes, if you can. This is, the, this is Jesus' answer to the man who, who's, who's basically telling Jesus, Lord, I'm having a real hard problem loving my son in this broken condition. Yet if you showed us compassion and love and healed him, then I could love. And Jesus says, let me love your son in the way God loves him. And if you could love your son in the same way God loves your son unconditionally, without conditions, oh, faithless generation, I come for the faithless to heal them and to cure them, says the Lord. All things are possible. If you could believe, Father, that I love your son just as much as you do, all things are possible. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. And Jesus saw the crowd running together, and he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out in convulsions, ter convulsing, convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse. So that most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he rose. And when all the people had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Some 
scriptures say fasting in prayer. Only God can do this. So he was showing to his disciples, one, they have limitations. They do have limitations. Number two, they're, he's showing his disciples that with God, all things are possible. And without God, none of it's possible. And it's not that our faith makes God a reality. It's not that our faith makes God exist. No, because God exists. Because God is willing to go into places no one else is willing. Because God is almighty and all-powerful, He can do what we cannot do. Even love a child more than his own flesh and blood. Help me with my unbelief. And he heals the boy so that he could believe that God does love his child in the same way he did. So what are we preparing for? The coming of our Lord. Like the thief in the night, Jesus will return at a moment when you are not expecting it, when you are not ready. So be ready. So be prepared. Right? Who is the sons of God and the sons of Abraham? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. We'll find refreshment, healing, and an answer to their prayer. Prayer is powerful. Speaking to God face to face, speaking to God is powerful. And notice how no matter what Jesus did, no matter who argued with him, no matter who despised him, he did his job anyway. That's love. I will love you like a wife. Through sickness. Through despair. Through the pains, the sufferings, and the trials. And I will hold you. See that wrapping God's word around our hand. Does it give you an everlasting sign? So we are the nail that held Christ to the cross. It wasn't our sins that held him there. It was his love for us that held him there. While we were broken, while we were sinners, God forgave us. You're already forgiven. It's not about forgiveness anymore. Let's move past forgiveness. You are forgiven. Let's become holy. Let's be healed. Ask God, heal me. Heal me. Heal me. Come into my life. Come into my presence. Let me see it. Transform me. That's what we want to prepare for. I want to be prepared so that when I walk into the darkness, I will not become darkness, but I will be the light that the darkness has never seen. Love. If I was sick, broken, abandoned, I would sure want someone to help me, save me, rescue me. Let us be that someone. We are not victims. We are empowered and endowed with the Holy Spirit 
so that we can walk into the darkest of valleys without fear. And why don't we fear? Because the Lord is with us. He is with us. He is with us. That's the unbelievable part. He is with us. And he has not destroyed us yet. It's not his desire. His desire is to heal you. Inside the all-consuming fire of God, the Holy Spirit, all the dross, the idols, idol worship, the, the need for someone else to, to validate you, all disappears because it is God who validates you. He will transform you. Are you ready? Are you ready? Be ready. Your enemies are coming. Your persecutors are coming. Your haters are coming. They're going to drag you out of church and they're going to throw you out to the streets. They're going to mock you. They're going to make fun of you. Are you ready? Are you ready for the enemy? Be like Jesus when they come. And do not resist evil. Do not resist foul language, hatred, faithfulness, or faithlessness. But be ready. Be ready to do the work God has already ordained you to do. Be a father. Be a mother. Be a friend. Be to them what you wished they were to you. Your family. Love. kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do not wait. Many people are afraid in America that other countries and other religions are going to come in and devour their country. But if both your feet are planted firm on the rock in Christ's kingdom, you would know it is they who have everything to fear and not you. Because Christ's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And even if they, whoever they are, gain the whole world, and yet lose their soul in gaining it, what good will that prosper them? What good is that? Put your hope in Christ. And no matter what happens to the world, you will not be worried, afraid, or ashamed. Please God, listen to Jesus Christ. Everyone who believes in him has everlasting life. Be ready. He's coming. See you next time.